Hi everyone, my name is Aurora Bashinsky, and today I'm going to be talking about examining the mechanisms behind changing salinity distributions. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the impact on regional hylosteric sea level. This work was done with Lorzana at the Cron Institute at NYU. So in both models and observations, we see that salinity distributions are changing under anthropogenic forcing. The changing distributions in the interior result in hylosteric sea level anomalies, which have a near zero global mean, but can be significant regionally. To illustrate this, we can look at the figure on the right, which is from Draka al 2014. Um, so the rightmost column is looking at hylosteric sea level trends in millimeters per year. Um, and the left column is looking at thermosteric trends in millimeters per year. Uh, the top two rows are observations, and then the bottom row is the CMIP5 ensemble mean. And so what we can see is that in particular regions, the halosteric uh, sea level trend has a magnitude that's significant even when compared against the thermosteric trend. Um, so for example, we could look at the North Atlantic uh, where we see that there's a negative halosteric trend. And this is to some extent compensating the positive trend um, due to thermosteric change. So this motivates why we may care about interior salinity changes because it results in these halosteric sea level anomalies. Uh, there's also interest in the surface salinity field, um, as this is often used to infer changes in the water cycle. So the way that the surface salinity field is known to change under anthropogenic forcing is what's known as pattern amplification. Uh, so we can see this using uh, surface salinity observations, which are shown on the right. Uh, so this is from the EN4 data set from 1950 to 2016. And the top plot is showing the, the mean surface salinity over that time period, and the bottom plot is showing the trend over that time period. And so what we can see is that regions that are salty are getting saltier, and regions that are fresh are getting fresher. And this is what's known as pattern amplification. But salinity at a particular point, whether we're talking about in the interior or at the surface, can evolve for multiple reasons. So if we look at the tracer equation that's shown on the right, we see that salinity could change because of changes in sources minus sinks. So this is freshwater fluxes. Um, but it can also change because of changing ocean transport. Uh, so the advective term and the, and the mixing term. And so what I'm going to focus on in this talk is separating the effects of water cycle intensification versus circulation change on both the surface salinity and the halosteric sea level. And what I'm going to demonstrate is that water cycle intensification has a distinct imprint on both the surface salinity and the halosteric sea level, whereas circulation change from things like heat flux or wind stress change have a different imprint on those fields. The data I'm using for this is from the Ocean Only Flux Anomaly Forced Model Intercomparison Project. So the idea is that we can apply freshwater flux perturbations, heat flux perturbations, and wind stress change onto ocean only models. Um, and these flux perturbations are extracted from the ensemble mean of CMIP5 uh, centered around the time of CO2 doubling. So for example, the flux perturbation Q prime is shown on the left. Um, and this is the difference in the effect of heat flux centered around the time of CO2 doubling compared to a control climate. Um, and so the way that this would be applied in like a FAFMIT framework is a Q flux, which is the, the effect of flux in a control climate, um, would be applied for a control run. Um, and for a FAFMIP run, a Q plus Q prime would be applied. Um, so the effect of flux in a control climate plus the, the flux perturbation. And this can be done for freshwater flux, heat flux, and wind stress change. And this will allow us to separate the effects of, of these three things on the surface salinity field. So the framework that I'm going to use is starting from the surface salinity probability distribution function, which is shown on the right for one of the ocean models. Um, so this is the, the surface salinity probability distribution function in the last 10 years of the control run. The x-axis is salinity, and the y-axis is area. And I'm going to fit the distribution with a Gaussian mixture model, which is shown with the, the solid black line. Um, and we can see that this is made up of six Gaussians, which are shown with the, with the dashed lines. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to number these Gaussians from one to six. Um, so one will be the, the freshest, and six will be the Gaussian with the, the saltiest mean. So this Gaussian mixture model allows us to cluster uh, points on the surface. Um, so this is shown in the, in the map on the bottom right there. Uh, so each uh, surface salinity point, excluding the Arctic, falls into one of these bins. Um, and the way that you decide if a point is in a bin is if its salinity 
has maximum probability of falling into, into that Gaussian. So for example, we could look at this, this dark green region which in which points are falling into the, the sixth bin. Um, and that's because their salinities have a maximum probability of, of being in that in that sixth bin. Okay, so we can use this framework to look at responses in surface salinity to each of the four things. So I'm gonna start by showing uh, in blue here, the, the response of salinity to freshwater flux forcing. Um, so along the x-axis, we have the number of the Gaussian, um, and on the y-axis, we have the mean change in salinity. And so what this is plotting is the mean change in salinity at the end of a freshwater flux perturbation experiment um, compared to the control. So for example, if we were to look at this data point, we'd be comparing the mean salinity at the end of a freshwater flux perturbation experiment in bin one uh, compared to control. And so we see that the mean salinity gets fresher. Um, and similarly, we could say for, for this data point up here that in the saltiest regions, um, the salinities are getting saltier. Um, and we can refer to the map down here for, for where these regions actually lie. But what we see is that with a freshwater flux perturbation, we see pattern amplification that we referred to earlier. Um, so the saltiest, re saltiest regions getting saltier, the freshest regions getting fresher, and some kind of linear relationship between them. We can similarly look at what happens with a heat flux forcing and with a wind stress forcing. So if we look at the, the red dots here, this is showing the change in each of these bins due to a heat flux forcing. Um, and what we see is kind of some form of pattern amplification in the saltiest regions. So in regions four, five, and six, we see that the, the saltier region was when it was kind of binned by this control uh, clustering, um, the saltier it's getting. Um, but in regions one through three, I think things are a little bit less clear. Um, and then finally, if we look at the yellow dots, we see that there's very little coherent trend for, for a wind stress forcing. So we can use the same framework to look at the response of halosteric sea level. And so we're gonna use the exact same bins, which again are shown in, in the bottom left there. Um, and we'll look now instead at, instead of looking at the change in mean salinity, we'll look at the mean halosteric sea level change in centimeters. So looking at the blue dots, what we see is that there's some interior reflection of pattern amplification, um, but there's larger changes occurring in the saltiest regions. Um, and so the most, the highest magnitude halosteric sea level change due to freshwater flux forcing is happening in regions five and six. Um, if we look at heat flux, what we see is that there's some negative halosteric change in the saltiest regions, although the magnitude of this is much less than the magnitude of, of the change due to a freshwater flux forcing. Um, we also see that in regions two and four, uh, there's some opposition um, against what the change was due to uh, freshwater flux forcing. So for example, specifically in region two, there's a negative halosteric sea level change due to heat flux forcing. There's a positive halosteric sea level change due to freshwater flux forcing. And these are of similar magnitudes and are canceling out um, so that the, the overall halosteric sea level change is, is quite small. Um, and the same can be true of region four, um, which again, you can see on the map. And then, the, the final thing that we see is, again, wind stress change is, is not making much of a significant impact here. OK, so final, so what we're looking at on the last slide was causes of halosteric sea level change. Um, so breaking that down into uh, wind stress forcing, heat flux forcing, and uh, freshwater flux forcing. Here, what we're going to look at is the proportion of halosteric sea level change to thermosteric sea level change. So this should contextualize where we actually care about the, the halosteric signal. So the y-axis is, is halosteric sea level change divided by thermosteric sea level change. Um, and again, what we see is that the regions in which there's this, the most halosteric change is the saltiest regions, five and six. Uh, so for example, in region six, the halosteric change is more than 30% of the thermosteric signal in magnitude, uh, and it's opposing it in sign. We also see in five that there's some compensating impact uh, in, in this region, although less strongly than six. And then in regions one and three, which is parts of the subtropics and the mid-latitudes, we see that the halosteric anomaly is positive and is reinforcing the thermosteric rise. Um, and then in regions two and four, there's fairly insignificant change compared against the thermosteric change. Um, and we can region, reason out that this is uh, because of what we saw on the last slide, which is that there's some cancellation 
between the halosteric change that was caused by um, a freshwater flux versus a heat flux, and this is resulting in a low overall anomaly. Um, so region two, which was mostly the Southern Ocean um, and a couple other regions, um, and region four are, have very little halosteric change. And just to further visualize where halosteric change is important, uh, this map in the bottom left is now highlighting regions in which the halosteric anomaly magnitude is greater than 15% uh, compared to the thermosteric anomaly. Um, and what we can see is much of the Atlantic, it, th that, mag it, that magnitude reaches the threshold um, and regions of like the mid-latitudes and subtropics in the Pacific and Indian Oceans as well. Okay, so what we've done here is quantified how the surface salinity distribution is changing under different forcings by fitting a Gaussian mixture model to the surface salinity distribution and then examining changes within the six uh, Gaussian regions that were defined. What we found on the surface is that salinity showed kind of a classic pattern amplification when we applied a freshwater flux and a form of pattern amplification that was skewed to the largest changes in the saltiest regions for a heat flux. Um, and for wind stress change, there was very little overall trend. Similarly, we used the same framework to analyze um, the causes of halosteric sea level change. Um, as a caveat, this may have missed some features due to taking means over large bins, um, and those bins were defined by the, the surface salinity distribution. Um, but regardless, it's still useful for general categorization. And so what we found is that the saltiest regions had the largest mean halosteric change. Uh, this was negative, and so it strongly compensated with thermosteric rise. In some of the fresher regions, halosteric uh, the halosteric anomaly was positive and reinforced thermosteric rise. And then finally, looking at the breakdown of, of the, the forcing causing halosteric um, anomalies, what we found is that where halosteric anomalies are the most significant, so in bins one, three, five, and six, the response is largely set by water cycle change with some secondary contribution from redistribution due to heat flux. And so this reinforces the need to better quantify expected water cycle changes, as that's really what's causing these halosteric anomalies. Thank you.